Hello, I'm Althea Talbot Howard and I would like to give you a bit of an overview of the wonderful work Six Metamorphoses After Ovid by Benjamin Britten. As you're probably aware, this year, 2013, is the 100th anniversary of Britten's birth. He was born in November 2013, so actually going forward from September it will be, strictly speaking, Britten's 100th anniversary season as regards concert planning. The premiere of this piece was given in 1951, on the 14th of June, by the oboist Joy Boughton. And in fact, Britton wrote the work for Joy Boughton. She amazingly gave the premiere in the open air, standing on a punt in the Mere, which is a boating lake near Thorpness in Suffolk on the east coast of England. So just imagine that, playing this piece with all its drama, all its technical complexity, all its expressiveness, on a punt, i.e. on a flat-bottomed boat, and managing not to fall in while you're doing it. So, pretty impressive by Joy Boughton. I think that the fact that the premiere was given outside really raises some questions for us in a way, because now that the piece is so established in the repertory, I think it's almost all the time played indoors. I'm certainly doing this video inside. But I think there's an interesting challenge for us that we might like to think about opportunities that we might have actually to play this piece of music out of doors. So perhaps you'd just like to go and think about that. Is there ever going to be an opportunity when you could perform perhaps two of these movements or the whole piece outside at some kind of outside summer concert would be a wonderful thing. The first broadcast was given by Joy Boughton in 1952. And in fact, um, there is actually a CD available, which I'm going to tell you a bit about towards the end of this video. And on that CD, uh, Joy's broadcast has been reproduced, so you can actually listen to the very first recording that was made of the piece. The literary source of the piece is um, a, an epic poem by the Latin Roman poet Ovid. As I said in my introduction to the Niobe teaching video, which accompanies this video. Ovid was, in a sense, contem contemporaneous with Christ. His dates were 43 BC to 17 AD. The piece is based on pagan myth, pagan folklore from Greece, from, um, from Rome, from Etruria, also from Babylon and from other countries like that. I would like to suggest that if you don't actually know the work, that you do buy it and that you read the books that have the appropriate tales in them. So for example, Pan is in book one, Niobe is in book six, Bacchus crops up in, in different books in the, within the whole work. So do get a copy and enjoy reading it. It's quite a strange read for us. I think there's very little in modern literature that will correspond with this kind of um, writing. Just to reassure you, the version that I use is actually a prose translation and I'm not sure whether it is possible to get um, a poetry translation at the moment. So if you're uncomfortable about reading a very long poem, chances are you'll be reading it in prose in any case. You might be thinking, why did Britain choose this work anyway? Why did he choose to base a solo oboe work upon this? A classical education, that was an education in Greek and Latin, was very important in the British education system really up until about the 1970s. Many schools still teach Greek and Latin, but not the general run of schools. However, in Britain's day, if you were from the middle classes or the upper classes, you were given a classical education. So that was very much a part of his um, school education. In many respects, it would have been quite an obvious thing for him to do. Whereas for us, you know, it might be a little bit more unusual, but for him, it was part of his cultural background. And we can see that he did enjoy um, tapping this, this ancient civilised culture for ideas. For example, take for example his opera The Rape of Lucretia, also his realisation of Purcell's Dido and Aeneas, and also Phaedra. So classical uh, themes were quite important to Britain. Practically speaking, it is a challenging work, and I think that there are four principal contexts in which you might find yourself performing this piece. And Depending on the context, you may find that you want to do a certain amount of the piece or all of it. And I think it's quite important to think 
about how you approach the piece in the context in which you're programming it. Let's take the first context, which would be for an audition. That might be for an amateur or a youth orchestra, for a music college, or for university entry. The second context in which you might play it would be for an exam, either a graded music exam, so grade seven or eight for Trinity Guildhall and the Associated Board, or a graded exam at music college or university, or an international competition. It might be set as one of the pieces that one has to play, and normally in that context, one would have to play the whole work. Also, for the professional examinations, the whole work normally crops up in the licentiate exams. So if you were doing the LTCL or the LRSM, playing the whole work would be one of your options. The other context would be in a shared recital when you are one of many performers who is playing a solo item. And there you might want to play perhaps two of them or the whole thing. The final and most challenging um, environment in which you might perform the piece is either in a solo lunchtime or a full evening professional recital. And there the piece actually gives rise to a few programming difficulties which I'll be talking about. So I would like to make some suggestions as to the way in which you could get the best out of a piece in these different contexts. For an audition, you normally would have to play two contrasting movements and the most tried and tested pairing, I believe, is Pan and Bacchus. I think that you couldn't do better. Um, it's such a wonderful contrast. Pan is full of lyricism. It gives you a chance to show what your sound quality is and also how expressively you can play and it's full of dynamic contrasts. Bacchus is a complete contrast in style and gives great opportunities for characterization, lots of tonguing, fast finger work, tempo changes and so forth. So as a package together, the two pieces really display what you as an oboist can do. And also, they form a wonderful artistic contrast for an audience as well. So even for the panel listening to you, if you play Pan and Bacchus, the panel will feel that they have gone some way towards understanding who you are as an oboist. As regards to graded music exams, I've mentioned these briefly in the teaching videos. Um, Trinity Guildhall Grade 7, you can play Pan or Bacchus. Going forward in 2014, Grade 8 will continue to be what it is now, which is Niobe and Narcissus. So there you have no choice. And the same thing goes for the Associated Board exams. Um, currently, it's Phaeton or Niobe or Arethusa for Grade 8. From 2014, you'll have Grade 7, you could play Pan. Grade 8, you could play anything but Pan. So if you're thinking about doing one of those higher grades in the forthcoming years, check the syllabus carefully and make sure that you are playing the right movement. Um, as I mentioned, for a professional examination, you would play the whole work for the licentiate exam. If you were playing this in a shared recital, then I think probably you would either want to play two movements, one slow and one fast, or the whole work. And it's now the other options for pairing movements that I'd like to look at to give you some ideas as to how best you could combine the different parts of the piece. As I said before, the oldest one in the book is Pan and Bacchus, and you can never go wrong with that. However, you might decide that it's a little bit old hat for you and that you would rather do something different. And then there are various thematic pairings that you can do. The principal themes in the six metamorphoses are unrequited love and water, parental loss and the sins of youth. In the case of unrequited love and water, we have three stories that are all about one spirit being in love with another one and then there being some degree of involvement of water or transformation into water. And those are Pan, Narcissus and Arethusa. As regards parental loss, we have Niobe, who laments the death of her 14 children, and Phaeton, who um, is killed in a chariot accident and his father laments his death. As regards the sins of youth, we have Phaeton, again, basically a case of joy riding in the chariot, Bacchus, all night partying, Narcissus, self-absorption. Now, if you're a young person, you feel I'm being too hard on you, I was young once too. Okay, so nobody knows better 
well, I hope I didn't know some of those sins, but um, certainly it's basically development stages and that, those are the interesting things that Britain is looking at in, um, in this piece. Some quite universal themes, unrequited love, the loss of a child and the sins that we can commit before we enter into wisdom as mature adults. So the first of combination that is thematic that I would like to suggest is Pan and Arethusa. Basically, in both of these um, movements involve the pursuit of a nymph. As I've said in another video, a nymph is a semi-divine spirit maiden who inhabited trees, hills, woods, rivers or sea. So a nymph is pursued by a god who wants her and she doesn't want him. And, um, so, and then she's basically either transformed into marsh reeds in the case of Syrinx in Pan, or actually into a stream as was the case with Arethusa. There's a good key match. Pan is in the Lydian mode of D major, written as A major, and Arethusa is, is in D major, in the normal diatonic D major. So you've got a good key match there. Um, the second option is Niobe and Phaeton. It's not a very common combination, but I think it works really well. Those are the two that have the theme of parental loss, Niobe lamenting her children, Phaeton being lamented by his father, and it's all about his chariot ride. We have D flat major for Niobe and C major, basically for Phaeton. And we've also got a really good contrast of legato, quite slow legato and fast staccato. So Niobe and Phaeton is a pairing that you could consider. And then thirdly, we've got either Narcissus and Bacchus or Narcissus and Phaeton. With um, Narcissus and Bacchus, we have F minor, even though it's written as C minor, it's actually it begins in F minor. F minor as opposed to F major for Bacchus. We've got the youthful Narcissus versus the youthful partying. Or with Narcissus and Phaeton, We've got F minor and C major, so they're not too, too far apart. Narcissism plus the youthful joy riding in the chariot. So just to go through those pairings again, you could do Pan and Arethusa, you could do Niobe and Phaeton, or you could do Narcissus and Bacchus, or Narcissus and Phaeton. Should always be one slow followed by one fast. And I think that in general, if you're not going to perform the whole work, it's best just to perform two of them, because if you perform three, your audience might think, well, why aren't you performing all of it? So really, either two or all six. When it comes to professional recital programming, I think that this is not a particularly straightforward piece to program. The first issue is its length. It normally comes up at about between 12 and a half and 13 and a half minutes in performance in a concert. By the time you've come on stage, breathe between each movement, perhaps done a spoken introduction of the read out Britain subtitles if that's what you like to do. So that's actually quite a lot of time to take up with just a solo oboe piece in a recital that you might be doing with piano, for example. Normally in my recitals, I do a solo piece and my duo partner Dominic does a solo piece, but I wouldn't normally play for 12 or 13 minutes on my own. So that's something that you've got to think about do I want to spend this amount of time on this piece and have my pianist sitting with his or her legs crossed backstage having a drink of water for ages? So that's something that you need to think about. The other issue when um, programming the whole thing for a professional recital is the level of difficulty. It does take up a lot of practice time. So you need to make sure that you have time to practice this work up to the standard that you would like it to be in addition to all the other music that you have to put together for your recital. One of the challenges I find with this, and it's one of the reasons why I don't play it very much actually, is as you may be aware from my videos or looking at my website, my career is very much playing the three oboes, the oboe, the oboe de more, and the corps anglais um, equally in my recitals. So I rarely spend any more time on the oboe than I do on the de more or the corps. And this actually really presents an embouchure issue for me with the six metamorphoses because I feel that they really need a good, solid om oboe embouchure the whole way through. And I find that if I have a recital where I'm playing the cor anglais a lot, when I come to play this, I just think, why did I program this? Because I find it really difficult to 
particularly there's a lot of high work, there's low work, there's soft, there's diminuendos, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know what goes on in this piece. So that's something else to think about, that I think it can work very well, of course, in a professional recital, but in my experience, generally in one where the oboe is predominant. So if you're planning your core anglais recital, find another solo piece, that's all I would say. Um, I think, however, the piece, having just talked about these drawbacks, I must just mention some benefits. It's a famous piece, promoters often know it, and audiences often know it, and they certainly know Britain's name, and it can help to promote your programme, it can help to sell the concert. So there are very good reasons why you might consider putting it in. So basically, one way around this issue um, of the length of the work in a whole recital and other things is just to choose one pair of movements, such as I've discussed already. The other place um, where it does go well is in a full-length recital, which has an interval in the middle. And I find that normally, on the occasions that I do play all of the six metamorphoses after Ovid, which, as I say, doesn't come around that often for me because of the fact that I do these mixed recitals, the normal place where I would put it would be straight after the interval. So I might start my recital, be it with harpsichord or with piano or with any other instrument, probably would start on the oboe, then play um, a couple of pieces on the oboe, then play a biggish piece on the demore, come off stage, and my partner would have also, my duo partner would have played a solo piece in the middle of that first 40 minute half, come off, and then after the interval come back on, play this, and then go off again and have five or six minutes while my duo um, partner plays another solo piece and then finish off the concert together. So that would be my advice um, as to how to program this in a professional recital. But of course it's entirely up to you, but I would just like to give you the benefits of some of my experience so that you can make sure that if you are playing the whole thing that you put it in the right place in a program. In a lunchtime recital you might want to play the whole thing if you are a little bit short of other music. On the other hand, you might just want to play two movements. Um, I would really like to recommend this CD, and this is um, a research project by the former head of the Birmingham Conservatoire in the Midlands in England, um, Professor George Caird. It's a wonderful CD that is available on the Oboe Classics label, and Oboe Classics is, is my record label. So it's part of the stable of um, Oboe recordings that is available um, at Oboe Classics. It's called Britain, Six Metamorphoses After Ovid, Anatomy of a Masterpiece. And what it includes is um, three different recordings. A recording by George Caird, the original radio broadcast by Joy Boughton, for whom the work was written, and then Nicholas Daniels' live recording that he did to his students at his, um, in his studio at Trossingen. And I'm sure you're aware that Nick also has videos available here on YouTube, but obviously if they're on disc like this, then you don't have to be watching your computer to listen. You can actually hear him play here as well. In addition to that, George has written this amazing 20,000 word booklet about the piece. So just to give you an idea, this is it. And it's basically, as I say, a research project gives so much information about the history of the piece. There's a photograph of Joy Bowden, for example. Um, many other things. The other thing that's on the, um, on the disc itself is George having recorded um, basically the sketches, some of the compositional sketches that Britain uh, discarded before he finalised the work. So it's a real, as it, as it says here, an anatomy of a masterpiece, and I couldn't recommend this disc highly enough. So if you are a serious student of Six Metamorphoses after Ovid, why would you be without this? So oboclassics.com, order a copy, read and enjoy. Final thing to discuss, just very briefly in this video, are the issues that arise with teaching this piece. And as a major piece of repertoire, I think it's quite important as a teacher not to be overly didactic when it comes to interpretation. So one of the things that I've often struggled with when I come back to the piece is having learnt it very young and having been told how to play this and how to play that. And I think sometimes that that can be a little bit of a killing influence when one's older. So obviously there are so many technical things that one has to teach as a teacher, but if you are a teacher and you're watching this video, 
I would suggest that the pr primary focus actually really in some respects is on technique. Um, obviously one wants to convey the understanding of the score so the performance directions need to be clearly understood and if pupils, oh, my book has disappeared, but if pupils are struggling with that there are various publications that they can get which will give them all the Italian terms that they need. Um, but I think it's really important in this to encourage, in this piece, to encourage interpretative freedom in the pupil. So obviously one wants to give some guidelines and some directions, but really I think it's important to encourage the pupil to be very free with the imagination, to try to enter in to the scenes that Britain was depicting. It's so programmatic, I mean, it's just the ultimate piece of program music. So I think that it's important that one shouldn't, in a sense, over-parent the pupil with this piece, but just allow enough scope for the pupil to come up with his or her own ideas. And I think then that way we'll always continue to have, um, even though so many people play the piece, there will continue to be freshness in the various interpretations that come about.